Hello everyone, welcome to my messy studio. My name is Mark and I'm an artist and an art professor. And in this video, we're gonna talk about gray fountain pen inks. I'm going to tell you why I love drawing with them, show you five of my favorite gray inks, and if that wasn't enough, give you five suggestions on how they can be used for drawing. Let's get started. It used to be that fountain pen inks came in any color you wanted, so long as it was black, blue, or brown. Black ink is of course fantastic, giving your drawings bold contrast and a strong graphic quality, but it can be difficult to use, particularly when you're attempting to build up values gradually. This is where inks that are lighter in value have an advantage. They're easier to work with, allowing you to get delicate transitions and ultimately produce work that is softer, more subtle, and less graphic. This is why many of the old masters so often relied on transparent brown inks in their drawings. But how can you achieve that softness in black and white? One solution is to dilute black ink, but while this works with dip pens, fountain pens are fussy things and diluted ink, unless you use a special diluting liquid, doesn't work well in them. Well, fortunately for us, now there are a number of wonderful great inks on the market, allowing us to have our cake and eat it too, to create lighter, more delicate work while still working in black and white. To drive home the point, and hopefully not to belabor it, I'm doing two renderings of a sphere, one with gray ink and one with black. The gray ink in the first sphere is lighter and therefore much more conducive to gradual buildup of value. Best of all, since many of these gray inks, when you layer them enough, will appear close to black, you don't lose much in the way of contrast. As you can see, the difference in contrast and sharpness is barely noticeable, and yet the sphere executed in gray ink was much easier to do. But besides making it easier to work softer, gray inks have a number of other advantages, which I'll talk about as I show you these five fantastic inks. Here they are, Diamine Gray, Diamine Earl Gray, then Pilot Iroshizuku Fuyu Syogun. These are three inks with low water resistance. And then Luther's Licensing Gray and De Atramentis Urban Gray, two inks that are highly waterproof. Let's start with Diamine Gray, an ink that is a fairly recent purchase that has quickly turned into one of my favorites. But before I do, allow me to slip in a quick plug. I recently started teaching workshops online, so if you like how I teach and explain things and want more, please go to my website and check out my range of fun, affordable workshop offerings. Okay, on to the ink reviews. In the interest of being systematic in the way I review inks, I've developed a series of short tests that focus on properties that will be of interest to artists. I'm using a very nice printmaking slash drawing paper here called Stonehenge Legion, which has a soft, slightly textured surface. For all of these tests, I'm using this very special pen, an Opus 88 demonstrator with a 14K semi-flex nib custom ground by fpnibs.com. Because it's a flex pen, it's particularly sensitive to the wetness of the ink, and you can immediately see when the ink is dry and when the ink is wet, more so than you can in some of my other pens. Plus, this pen is super fun to use and has been out of my rotation for a while, so why not? In the first test, which simply checks the value range, we see that this ink goes quite dark, stopping just short of being fully black. This could easily be a softer, more delicate substitute for black inks without compromising the requirements of contrast in your work in any way. I should also note, since I'm using a water brush to create washes, that it spreads very evenly and is very well behaved in washes. Shading is a term I borrow from the fountain pen community to refer to inks that are highly transparent, so that their value varies greatly depending on how thickly they're applied. While inks with high shading properties sometimes look uneven, too much evenness in your work can be a bad thing, and I personally enjoy the often wonderfully unexpected variation of value that shading inks bring to a drawing. That said, with this ink, the shading is pretty gentle, somewhere in the middle of the scale. For water resistance, we'll put down a few vertical and horizontal lines and come back to them when they're dry to see how they handle water. Color variation is a very interesting test because you'll find that many inks are composed of a number of different pigments that cause the color of the ink to not be uniform. Sometimes this lack of uniformity is visible in a test like the one I'm doing, but to really see what pigments form the basis of the ink you're using, you need to use a chromatography strip, which is what I've done here. In this case, this ink is composed solely of gray pigments, which make the color very uniform, which is great if you're looking for an ink that can be put down in even washes.
The flow test is mainly for those who are interested in using their inks in flex pens, since this is where it's most crucial. However, high flowing ink also puts down wider, wetter lines, so this is something that everyone needs to be aware of. This ink is on the wetter side, making it good for flex pens, but it does put down a line that's quite wet, making a pen that normally puts down a fine line put down a line that's closer to a medium. And finally, let's go back to the water resistance test to see how the lines hold up in a wash. And it's very low, meaning that it won't clog up your pens and will be easy to clean. Let me show you just one way of using this ink that takes full advantage of its evenness of color and high water solubility. In this drawing, I start with a pen and put down a few lines and a little bit of hatching just to establish the general shadow areas. These lines will mostly not be visible at the end, so I don't have to be super precise about them. Then I go over the lines with a water brush to create washes, and once those washes are dry, they become an excellent base for finishing the drawing with a pen. This is a terrific quick sketching technique that allows for a wide range of effects with very minimal means, only a water brush and a pen, and works absolutely great with this diamine gray ink. Here is another gray ink made by diamine, one that is different from diamine gray. This ink is called Earl Gray, like my favorite tea. Let's take it through the tests. Here is the value test, and we see that it has a much fuller range than diamine gray, going almost completely black, and that it has a much more purplish tone to it. This speaks to another advantage of gray ink. Often, they're not purely gray, but come in a variety of shades. You can find grays that are warmer, giving your drawing a gentle vintage sepia tone, or grays that are on the greenish side, which might be great for landscape sketching. So if you're someone who likes color, but still wants to work black and white, this Earl Grey is the way to go, if that makes sense. In the shading test, this ink is more transparent than diamine gray and therefore has higher shading properties. Again, shading creates lines that are more varied in value, which can appear uneven, as if the pen is struggling with ink flow. But I enjoy the unevenness that shading inks create. Uniformity can be a negative trait, and many artists carefully build unevenness and spontaneity into their work by choosing materials that don't behave well, or cause all kinds of unexpected effects. This is an ink for such people. Let's put down some lines for water resistance and get back to them later. In the color variation test, things get interesting. The ink quickly splits into two components, a grayish purple and a brown, creating a wash with lovely color variation. A chromatography strip reveals that unlike diamine gray, which is made with a single gray pigment, this ink is instead a mixture of green, red, and blue pigments, which neutralize each other. The benefits of mixing gray out of primary colors is well understood by painters, since such mixtures are richer and more varied. In flow, this ink is visibly drier than diamine gray, making it not as effective in flex pens. But the trade-off here is that it's great if you want an ink that'll produce fine lines. These things are very pen dependent, however, and it's often hard to anticipate how a certain ink will behave in a certain pen. This is one of the reasons why I enjoy collecting pens and inks. The joy of getting that perfect pairing between pen and ink sometimes feels like hitting the jackpot. Let's return to the water resistance test where we discover that the sink has an interesting property in that the brown component is more water resistant than the purplish gray, the former leaving slightly softened lines behind as the latter washes away. This property, having both a water resistant and a water soluble component, makes it suitable for the drawing technique I'm going to show you right now. The first thing to notice as I begin the drawing is how much thinner the lines are here compared with the ones I put down with diamine gray. This shows just how important the right ink is in pen performance. People often write to me asking about problems with their pens, skipping or writing too thick or railroading, and my response is usually twofold. First, clean your pen, and have you tried it with a different ink? You'll be surprised how much difference it can make in making a pen write effectively. Okay, back to the drawing. This technique is very simple. I put down initial lines and hatching as I normally do, bringing the drawing to a greater degree of finish than the first stage of the previous drawing. Once the lines are dry, I'll go over them with a water brush to create a wash. However, unlike with diamond gray, where the lines entirely dissolve into an even wash, 
The brown, water-resistant component here stays put, leaving behind softened lines and hatching. I find the combination of warm brown lines and uneven purplish-gray wash to be really lovely. And once those washes have dried, you can go back in with a pen to reinforce contrast, add detail and texture. Like the previous technique, this is a fantastic way of sketching using very minimal means, nothing but a pen and a water brush. But the effect here is different than with a diamine gray. As opposed to being clean and monochromatic, this technique creates a bloom of color variation and a wilder, more expressive effect, great for those of you who enjoy introducing an element of chaos into your work. The next ink is made by Pilot and is in their Iroshizuku series. This one is called Fuyu Syogun, which in Japanese means Old Man Winter. In the value range test, this ink is probably the lightest of the five I'm going to show you. But such things are actually heavily dependent on paper, which like inks, is an often ignored component in a pen's performance. This is a topic for a separate video, of course, but unless absorbed in paper, such as Bristol, the ink will mostly sit on the surface and appear lighter. Whereas on a more absorbent paper, where the ink can penetrate the surface and build up thickness, it'll appear darker. In the shading department, this ink is highly transparent and therefore has high shading properties. Again, this is paper dependent since ink's shading properties are more pronounced on less absorbent papers. Let's put down a few lines for the water resistance test and get back to them in a while. In the color variation test, this ink performs similarly to diamine earl gray in that it splits into several components, this time a grayish purple and a greenish purple. The chromatography test, which often yields surprising results, shows that there are several pigments in this ink, but this is primarily composed of a purplish gray and a brilliant pink pigment. Though not as varied in color as the diamine earl gray, it still yields a good deal of rich, beautiful color variation, which will be good for those that want a touch of it without going to the extremes of diamine earl gray. In the flow test, like most of the pilot Iroshizuku inks, it's very wet, which makes it perform extremely well in flex pens. In fact, this pen, as much as I love it, is the equivalent to a finicky cat when it comes to ink selection, and is almost always filled with Iroshizuku ink. So, if you're having problems with a railroading flex pen, the solution often can be to turn to one of these excellent inks. Now let's return to the water resistance test, and like the diamine earl gray, it looks to be slightly water resistant, though the leftover lines are so pale they would not be useful for the technique I previously showed. Since this is such a wonderfully juicy ink, one way that I enjoy using it is in a pen with a fude nib. I have quite a few videos on these wonderful nibs and how to use them if you're interested, but by holding the nib at a shallow angle, I'm able to put down juicy, brush-like strokes. The lightness and transparency of this ink allow me to layer those strokes and build up my values gradually. With this technique, that also takes advantage of the slight texture of the paper, I can create energetic, atmospheric drawings with lots of lovely calligraphic effects. And because it has some water resistance, I can go over it at the end with a water brush to soften edges and introduce halftones and highlights. This is a wonderful quick sketching technique using only a Fude pen and a brush. Now let's talk about De Atramentis Urban Grey. Not much of a value range in this one, and I struggled to get a dark gray out of it, even when I piled it on. But, since this ink is waterproof, I suspect that I should be able to layer it to make it go much darker. In terms of shading, however, I would say it's relatively high, limited slightly by this ink's lighter value. For water resistance, let's put down a few lines and get back to them later. In the color variation test, it performed very similarly to diamine gray in that it's composed of a single gray pigment and is very uniform in color. Because it's a water resistant ink, the chromatograph test didn't really work, but you can still see, even in this limited splotch, that the pigment didn't separate. As for flow, the ink is definitely on the drier side, putting down a fine line and not keeping up with the nib while flexing. As such, I wouldn't put this into a flex pen or any pen where you're looking for generous flow. Let's return to water resistance. 
This could have dried a little more, but even here you can see that the sink is highly resistant to water, which for certain things is fantastic. As you can see immediately in this drawing, this ink is quite dry, and in this pen, which usually puts down a line that's closer to a medium, creates an extra fine line. While not so good for juicy flecks, it does make it ideal for thin, multi-layered cross-hatching. You have to be careful with waterproof inks, since they can clog up your pen, and the standard recommendation is to give your pen a thorough cleaning every three weeks or so, even if the pen is used regularly. I also recommend not putting waterproof inks into any pen that isn't easy to take apart. But waterproof inks have so many advantages that they're worth the risk of the occasional clog. The biggest benefit is that they're great in combination with washes, and I often use them with watercolor. One unusual way to use this ink is to create washes with a water brush by lifting a touch of ink directly from the nib. This method tends to work best in pens with juicy ink flow, since in some pens you're not going to be able to collect enough ink from the nib to produce darker washes. But with just the right pen, this eliminates the need for a palette, the nib surface acting as a substitute. Another option is to dilute the sink and place the dilution directly into a water brush, though you lose some ability to control the value of your washes this way. This, like the other techniques, is perfect for sketching on the go, one that uses very minimal means to achieve a wide range of effects. And finally, let's talk about a fan favorite, Noodler's Lexington Gray. I've already done a detailed review of this ink, but this video would be entirely incomplete without it, and it had to be included. In the value range, it goes pretty dark, in its darkest aspects coming nearly close to pure black. This is great because you get all the benefits of using gray ink, the ease of use, etc., without any sacrifice of contrast. As for shading, this is one of the better shading inks of any color in my collection. This is an ink that is super transparent, super dark, and shows a tremendous amount of variation with every stroke, particularly when you're using it with a flex pen. Let's put down a few lines to check for water resistance and get back to them. In the color variation test, you can see that the ink splits slightly into a dark gray component and a light turquoise gray. The split is very slight, however, so your washes will still appear uniform. Since this ink is waterproof, the chromatography test didn't work well for it, but you can still see the split between dark gray and light blue here. In the flow test, this ink performed great, even better, perhaps, than the Pilot Hiroshizuku Fuyu Syogun. This makes this one of my absolutely favorite for flex. Notice that this is the only ink in these five tests where the pen didn't railroad at all which shows you just how persnickety this pen is, and also the terrific wetness of the ink. Let's try the water resistance test, and like the Diatramentus Urban Gray, it could have dried a touch longer, but still worked perfectly, showing itself to be very water resistant. This is one of my favorite inks for drawing, and I use it for just about everything, for quick sketches, for longer drawings, for bold lines, and for fine hatching. It's also the ink that I use in all my pen reviews since it allows me to see the ink flow in a pen. This magical elixir works in every single pen and should be a mainstay in everyone's ink collection. The Urban Gray is more uniform, yes, and perhaps even slightly more pleasant in its neutral color, but its dryness makes it less suitable for flex and limits its usefulness, whereas this ink is really all-purpose. The fact that this ink is capable of going very dark makes it great to use under watercolor wash. Whereas the Diatramentus Urban Gray was perhaps too light to be strongly visible under layers of watercolor, here the lines stay bold and visible, even if I go fairly dark with my washes. That said, you should still be careful and never make your washes so dark that they obscure your line work. This is a great technique for those that want a good balance between dark, bold lines and wash, but still wish to avoid the graphic harshness of using a black ink. I hope you enjoyed this presentation on gray inks, and if you did, let me know what other inks I should experiment with. Inks are a source of obsession in the fountain pen community, with endless discussions about their various properties in the chat groups and forums, but they're woefully neglected by artists, who automatically default to the traditional brown and black.
This, I think, is a shame because fountain pen inks are experiencing a renaissance moment with new and interesting inks coming out all the time, giving the artist who enjoys drawing with fountain pens an incredible range of possibility. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you back in my messy, now ink-stained studio very soon. Bye-bye.